Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 2020 Waterfront Botanical Gardens Annual Meeting. My name is Jamie Burkhardt. I'm the Director of Horticulture and Education here at the Botanical Gardens, and I'm coming to you live from somewhere in the Grazer Family Education Center to make sure that the experience is great for our in-person attendees um, in the main room, as well as our virtual attendees um, out there in the world. So welcome everyone, great to see you. Um, we are recording the presentation this evening, so if you were um, unable to stay for the whole time or you would like to revisit it or send the link to a friend in the future, we will be um, sending out that link in the near future, probably early next week. I wanted to mention initially, you know, how do you, how do you come across what the topic is or who the presenter is for our um, annual meeting and that has fallen on me the last two years and tonight's presenter was someone that I wanted to get last year but because of um, the timing of things it didn't work so um, hopefully a lot of you enjoyed Peter Hatch who was the former director of horticulture and grounds from Monticello that was very successful um, so this time because the year 2020 has been interesting to say the least in a, in a very charitable way um, I thought it would be nice that there would be a connection to one of our programming facilities, kind of a satellite campus of ours called the Avish. And this is how I was introduced to this evening's speaker. I never met her in person, but I was a fan of Top Chef, um, which we'll talk about. And then that's, that's where the connection comes in with us at Waterfront Botanical Gardens in Louisville, as well as the Avish. So to begin, um, I would like to turn this over to Elizabeth. Chandler, who will be um, showing a, a brief video that better explains um, how we're setting up um, tonight's presenter and our presentation. One example of a Kentucky classic may be found a few miles northeast from the Waterfront Botanical Gardens in downtown Louisville. The Avish Estate in Harrods Creek Prospect is listed on the National Registry of Historic Places. It spans 23 acres with multiple outbuildings, a carriage house, former horse barn, and two glass greenhouses. The mansion was built in 1910. The Avish was the home of famous Louisvillian Osley Brown Frazier, whose grandfather built the mansion. Osley Brown Frazier was a hometown philanthropist and the founder and chairman of Louisville's Fraser History Museum. He was the vice chair and public face of Brown Foreman from 1983 until his retirement in 2000. He served as director of Greater Louisville Incorporated and he was recognized as one of the leading donors to Louisville's Jewish Hospital. He held two honorary doctorates from the University of Louisville and Bellarmine University for his philanthropic efforts. Mr. Frazier passed away in 2012. Fast forward to 2018. After Frazier's death, the Avish estate sat quietly vacant for nearly seven years. It was purchased by its current owners and residents, Steve and Mary Kay Poe. The newly acquired estate revealed an untended formal garden, production display greenhouses, cold frames, and water garden, as well as a unique idea reimagine and reinvent this Kentucky classic. Mary Kay Poe approached Waterfront Botanical Gardens president Casey Mayer with an exciting idea. At the time, WBG's main site was still under phase one construction. There was no place yet to host educational programs and any newly planted trees would take years to cast any welcome shade. The Avish, on the other hand, with its formal gardens, two greenhouses, walk-in cold frames, barn and carriage house was the perfect location to kickstart our youth and adult education opportunities. In late 2018, WBG entered into an agreement to use the site for our programming. After a lot of work from volunteers and staff to restore the garden spaces, programming took off in 2019. The Avish allowed us to begin growing and evaluating ornamental and edible plants. We then hosted school group field trips from high schoolers to elementary youth and inquisitive and high energy preschoolers. Kids summer camps, family adventures, adult gardening classes, and even our Garden to Fork culinary series 
all combined to reinvent an area of the Avish. The Avish remains a valuable place to connect, inspire, and nourish people of all ages with edible and ornamental plants. But WBG wasn't the first one to take advantage of the facilities and the potential of this amazing classic garden space. Top Chef is a popular reality competition cable TV series on the Bravo Network. Debuting in 2006, Top Chef has now completed 17 seasons. It is hosted by Padma Lakshmi, and its head judge is accomplished New York chef Tom Colicchio. Each season of Top Chef serves not only as a cooking competition, but also as a sort of culinary travelogue exploring places from New York and San Francisco to Colorado and Charleston, South Carolina. Season 16 featured Kentucky. Top Chef Kentucky was dedicated to the cuisine and culture of the Bluegrass State, with filming and competitions in such places as Lake Cumberland, Lexington, and Louisville. The contestants, or chef-testants as they are called in the Top Chef world, experienced and competed at a variety of regional landmarks like Rupp Arena, Churchill Downs, the Brown Hotel, Butchertown Grocery, and the Muhammad Ali Center. When in need of food supplies, the chef testants went to the Whole Foods on Shelbyville Road. Fox Hollow Farm of Crestwood also was a source of grass-fed meat for the competition. While filming in Louisville, the chef testants lived at the Avish, where they also had the added responsibility of tending their own vegetable plots in the formal garden beds, the same ones that WBG uses today. Their veggie crops would later be utilized in one of the 30-minute quick-fire culinary challenges. While not all had a background in gardening, one of the chef testants was particularly good at managing her garden plot during her short time at the Avish. She caught our eye. Sarah Bradley hails from Paducah, Kentucky. She was one of the 15 contestants on Top Chef Kentucky. She was not only a talented competing chef, but also a proven gardener. Her veggie plot was so productive that she shared the bounty with other chefs whose areas were more quack grass than zucchini, tomato, leafy crops, and herbs. Sarah advanced to the competition finals in Macau, China, and ultimately was season 16 runner-up to fellow chef and personal friend, Kelsey Bernard Clark. Tonight, Chef Sarah Bradley is the keynote speaker for this year's Waterfront Botanical Gardens Members Annual Meeting. Chef Bradley reimagines some of Kentucky's most famous dishes. She will infuse flavors of pit-style barbecue, as well as world-famous country ham, bourbon, and century-old recipes into seasonal, locally sourced dishes. She will discuss the history of preserving fruits and vegetables, and she will also focus on the importance of communal cooking and how it has been affected during these trying times. So Chef Sarah, again, was born and raised in Western Kentucky. She grew up loving all the delicacies our region has to offer. The smooth apple butter her grandmother prepared every fall after the apples were plucked, and or the sweet strawberry pie her mother, kitchen mother, dessertress, would make from scratch every spring. She learned early on the flavor difference in fresh over frozen. She developed her skill set under the tutelage of Michelin star chefs John Fraser, Dovetail, New York, and David Posey and Paul Kahn, Blackbird, Chicago. After careful consideration, Chef Sarah opted to open Freight House to focus on and encourage agricultural sustainability here in her hometown of Paducah. Chef Sarah is also involved in many charitable and philanthropic endeavors within the community, including being a cartel, which is a Western Kentucky style pit barbecue team that raises capital funds for the restoration of historic buildings and numerous other nonprofits throughout the region. Chef Sarah was invited, of course, to compete on season 16 of the hit TV series Top Chef and again took second place after battling out with other talent. She has shared those over the next several weeks and joins us now. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chef Sarah. Hello, everybody. 
Thumbs up, you guys can hear me? Good. Well, um, thank you so much for having me. It was really interesting. So that intro was amazing. And it was super cool to see all of the pictures back at the AVH. It just reminded me so much. I don't think that when I got there um, for Top Chef, I realized that the impact that that building had on the community and that the gardens after we left, what they would do for educational purposes and for the community. So it's been really interesting to see it grow and develop since I left and I'm so happy to be a part of today. So um, I'll just jump right into it. Um, you know, they said a lot of the background info on me, you know, who I am, where I'm from. I think one thing that um, really speaks to the philosophy of how I've thought about food and how I thought about reimagining classics is uh, my roots. You know, I'm from Western Kentucky. I grew up in Paducah. Uh, my mother is from Muhlenberg County. Uh, my father is from Floyd County. So I've got these two different sides of the state. And then I went to college in Lexington. So I've really gotten to see and live and em you know, embrace all of these different regions of Kentucky, which when you really start to look at the cuisine of our state are so different. Um, another interesting thing is I was raised Jewish. So, you know, you mentioned in the intro about me doing apple butter. Well, I ate apple butter with potato latkes. So, you know, not like everyone else, it was always a little different, but um, those really shaped who I am as a chef and how I look at my philosophy on food. Um, yeah, you know, so like I said, I graduated from UK. After UK, I went to Johnson & Wells out in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, then I was down in Birmingham, Alabama for a while, up in New York City, Chicago, and kind of the farther I got away from Kentucky and from my home, the more I realized that I missed this food that was in Kentucky. I missed the rolling hills. I missed the swampy Western Kentucky. I missed everything about it. And so I needed to figure out a way to get back here. So I moved home to Paducah and opened the freight house with my parents, um, my mother making desserts, my father teaching me how to do the books because they don't teach you that in school. They don't teach you how to pay taxes. You gotta know how to do that. Um, yes, yeah, so I moved back here and the building that we took over to open the restaurant is in an old vegetable depot. So it was built in the 1920s um, and I don't think that I could have found a space that was more perfect because it spoke to directly what Freight House is. So Freight House is a um, hyper seasonal restaurant. So we feature things only when they're in season. Like you're never gonna get strawberries in January. You're never gonna get a tomato in April. It's just not gonna happen in Western Kentucky. So you're not gonna see them. And um, we are locally sourced. We source as much as we can from within a day's drive of the restaurant. Um, and we really pride ourselves on our community involvement. So, you know, we, uh, in, within our community, we are proud that we pay a living wage, um, a lot of different things like that. And we do that because we want to pump money into the economy. We really look at it as a sustainable um, agriculture, buying from our farmers, supporting all of our, you know, even our local gardeners. I have so many people locally at small levels that are growing herbs for me, weird peppers for me, all kinds of stuff like that. And these are just home gardeners that do that. Um, so I think what we can talk about is how do those things directly relate to what we're talking about today, which is how do we reinvent classics? Um, how do we do techniques that are so important to Kentucky, but without maybe having access to the traditional um, items you need to do that? So I think that one is you got to have that old school philosophy, you know, farm, to, people talk about farm to table and, um, you know, they act like it's a new trend, but it's not, it's the way my grandparents cooked, you know, they cooked with the seasons, with things that were local. And so I think people are just returning to that instead of trying to get super exotic ingredients. Um, we also love to take ingredients that are Kentucky proud, that are Kentucky known and throw in little flavors of different things. So maybe stuff from other areas in the South, things from my Jewish heritage in the Middle East or Eastern European. Um, you know, I thinking, I was just thinking of some of the stuff that we've had over the years, you know, we're doing beer cheese deviled eggs. 
we're doing burgoo broth. So instead of serving burgoo with its traditional five meats, we're doing it with its five local kind of um, water and locally sourced seafoods. Uh, we do roasted duck with black barbecue sauce, which is one of my favorites and something that's really interesting and we'll talk about in a second. Um, you know, we, like I said, we're always trying to serve vegetables. So Kentucky fried mushrooms instead of Kentucky fried chicken. So always looking for new ways to do that. And then the other part that really plays into Kentucky classics or even Southern classics and how do you reimagine those is the preservation techniques. So um, we are known for preserving food and not wasting food in Kentucky and it's something that I am so proud of. And it's super important to continue with pickling, canning, sugaring, all of those items. Um, yeah, so we really take hold of that and try to work that into what we're doing. Um, so I think we could talk about some of the, the way that we get to how we're going to reimagine classics. Um, like I said, I went to the University of Kentucky. I'm a big, big UK fan. All my parents graduated from there, all my siblings, sorry, Louisville, but I can't help it. Um, you know, I went there and I have a degree in statistical psychology and I worked there for a while. And I, after I graduated, I worked for about two months at my job and I did not like it. So I went back to school. I went to culinary school out at Johnson and Wells in Charlotte and I love to read. So I am a researcher. I take you know, I just think it's so important, you know, even when it comes to gardening or growing anything, you know, my house is full of plants, my garden is full of vegetables. Um, I really research about when to plant things, when to do these things. And so one of the things I love to do when I'm trying to recreate something is to dig through old recipe books and old magazines. Um, I can't tell you how many recipes we have and how many recipes I don't think you can beat. If you find them in a newspaper from like the 50s, they are most likely one of the most delicious recipes you're gonna ever get. It is just like tried and true. So I really dig through old books, um, old magazines, old newspapers, looking for stuff like that. Um, there's quite a few old cocktail books that I love. One is by an author who is from Paducah, Urban Cobb, and he wrote an entire book Full of bourbon recipes and so you know we take those old recipes and we rework things into them there are a ton of pawpaw recipes bourbon and pawpaw recipes pawpaws are something that we're super proud of in kentucky and so we are trying to rework those and make them taste delicious but we're finding that the pawpaws they don't taste the same as they used to we're hearing that from the old timers that they are definitely more tannic now than they were back then they're not as sweet um you know so just doing research is really important um i am a collector of old church cookbooks so i think i get that from the eastern kentucky side of my family i have stacks and stacks of old church cookbooks and i love to read through them um one dish that we found that we absolutely love at the freight house is our smoked fish dip and we found that and it was a it was used to be it was a smoked catfish dip and they were putting liquid smoke into the smoked catfish and i said well how can we actually smoke fish and recreate this dish that i'm seeing in one out of every two church cookbooks i'm seeing this smoked catfish dip how do i recreate that uh so here in a second when i talk about some of these preservation and smoking techniques i'll tell you a little more about that and then for that research, there's the good old internet, which I think we have all come to embrace a lot in the past six months, more than I ever have in my life. Um, you know, and it was so interesting when I started looking to do something to cook dinner for this event, um, I started looking, I wanted to try to do something that was very classic to uh, Louisville. So we found Henry Bain sauce. And in the intro, when you guys were talking about it, maybe, and I don't know if somebody can can hint in down there in the comments, um, I'm guessing Owsley Brown, so he was the owner of the Avish, and I guess his, Owsley Brown Fraser was the owner. And then was his father the man who created the, is it the Pendennis, is that how you say it, club in Louisville? 
because that's where Henry Bain come Henry Bain comes to us. So I I was reading, I was looking at it, and it was so circular that I imagined that we would do this dish with Henry Bain sauce, and it was created by um, you know somebody who worked at the original club uh, that Owsley Brown's family started. So it's kind of interesting. Um, but the internet, I mean, you type in Kentucky classics, and you're going to get hot brown, you're going to get um, Benedictine, you're going to get all of those. But if you really start to dig, there are so many classics that are regionally specific. Um, so the two things that really we featured in the food, and I'm sorry if you guys weren't able to get the food, if you're just doing this on Zoom, you guys should make sure you follow the, the Botanical Garden so that you can see when they have events, so you can make sure you get in on these. Um, but we had this delicious meal tonight. Um, one of the things that we really focused on with a lot of the food that we served was curing. So uh, two techniques I think that are very specific to Kentucky cuisine are both curing and smoking. So with curing, there's two types of curing. There's a wet cure and a dry cure. Um, your wet cure is your ham that you get at the grocery store. Um, we, the ham that we served tonight, or the, the pork that we served tonight had a wet cure on it. Um, the, what the wet cure is, is like a brine. So it is causing the piece of meat to retain moisture or the, the item to retain moisture. Um, it's working by osmosis. It is a really good way to get a lot of flavor and a lot of moisture into a meat, but it's not the best preservation technique. It does just, you know, it does make things a little bit, have a longer shelf life, but it's not the same way as doing a dry cure. So a dry cure is rubbing something down with salt. Sometimes people add sugar or nitrates, um, spices, things like that, that's your dry cure. And what the dry cure is doing is it is removing the moisture from the ingredient or from the item. So it is a lot harder for bacteria to grow. Number one, bacteria hate salt and bacteria needs moisture to grow. So by rubbing something down in salt, you are extracting the moisture from it and you're not making a very suitable environment for bacteria. So that's why things that are rubbed down in salt can be aged, you know. I mean, I've had hams that are five years old that are absolutely delicious and very funky, but they are that old. So the, just the addition of salt can make it happen that long. Um, you know, some of the things that we use these curing techniques on that you wouldn't normally use, um, we dry cure egg yolks. So egg yolks, um, whenever we have way too many eggs from one of our farmers, we break out the salt and the sugar and we bust eggs open and we cure the egg yolks. And we can go back and grade those on things. We can add a really, a lot of richness and depth of flavor and a little bit of seasoning by using this dry egg yolks. And then we don't let them go bad. Um, we dry cure our own hams in house. We dry cure chorizo and hang it, um, guanciale, lots of pork products. Um, for the wet cure, like I said, the pork butts that you guys had tonight for supper. Um, we do that with fish. So I mentioned earlier the smoked fish dip, which is one of the recipes that I found in lots of old church cookbooks. So what we're doing with fish is we are curing it in sorghum. So, or I'm sorry, brining it in sorghum. So we make a, a salt and sugar solution. This sugar is the sorghum and we brine fish in it. And then when it's done, we cold smoke it. And then we mix it up with like all kinds of yummy, delicious, creamy dips, and it's really, really good. Um, we also wet cure vegetables. So if you have someone with dietary restrictions or if you're just wanting to try something new, um, slicing vegetables thin and, and putting a little salt and sugar and a few drops of water on there and letting them sit, um, that salt and sugar will start to leach liquid from it and it'll end up curing in its own juices. And what you get is a product that has the texture of being cooked, but has the flavor of being raw. So a wonderful product, wonderful, easy thing to do. So you've got the curing. So that is one part that is so important when you have to look at ingredients and say, how can I take techniques that are Kentucky and redo them? The next part is the smoking. Um, and the smoking is, is wonderful. A long time ago when we opened the restaurant five years ago, I guess it wasn't that long ago, we bought an old pecan tree and we had it chipped. Um, and that is what we use to smoke most of our meat, vegetables, fish, things like that. So there's 
three different ways to kind of get that smoke flavor in there. I would say um, you've got your hot smoking. So, um, you know, they mentioned earlier that I have a barbecue team. So we do classic uh, Western Kentucky style pit barbecue. Um, we compete, we do pretty well. It's a lot of fun and we raise a lot of money doing it. Um, so that hot smoking is getting up into the 250 where the meat and or the items have direct access to heat from there. Cold smoking is when you're going to have smoke and you're not going to cook anything by the heat, but you're gonna put the smoke on it. And what that smoking does in the preservation part is the smoke coats the meat and almost, I hate this word, but I, I can't think of any other word for it, but almost creates this acrid like um, coating on the outside where again, bacteria cannot exist. Um, and that is what smoke does. It, it seals that meat and keeps any bacteria from getting in there. Um, another way to get that smoke flavor in here, and this is what we do, I do at home all the time, is by adding flavors. And I'm not talking about liquid smoke, I'm talking about good smoke flavors. Um, the pork shoulder that you guys had tonight, we rubbed that down. So we did a couple different ways to get flavor into there. So we use a smoked brine, we use smoked paprika, we braised it in dried um, smoked peppers, and so we really put a lot of stuff in there to add that flavor. Um, so, you know, I think that if you want to reinvent a classic dish, you have to look at what the basic parts of it, which are the techniques to get to that dish. Uh, and then you can really do kind of anything you want. Um, you know, another really kind of cool part about Kentucky, and I think that most of most people know you know they think kentucky they think horses basketball bourbon i don't know if it's in that order but those are the three things that i think of when i think of kentucky um but what i've really found in a lot of my research of doing with food is that we have the most amazing location in the world this kind of kentucky tennessee it has this area what is called the hand belt so the hand belt exists um all the way from kind of Missouri across to North Carolina, but the really perfect concentrated area of the hand belt um, runs right through Kentucky and Tennessee. And then you've got these spots where our climate is super similar to areas over in Europe, which are super similar to areas over in Asia. So there's three areas in the whole, in the whole world that have climates similar to Kentucky, Tennessee, and we all make aged booze, and we all make great ham. So, I mean, it's it's just impressive to see if you look at it on a map, um, the ham belt. So what makes that ham belt so beautiful? Uh, like I said, the location and the climate. So we have very cold winters and we have very hot summers. So if you picture a bourbon barrel and the bourbon, you know, the liquid sitting in there and in the summer it gets hot and that bourbon swells up and in the winter it gets cold and it goes down. It gets hot, it gets cold, hot and cold. Ham does the exact same thing. So not only is it penetrating and pushing that salt in and out of the ham, it's developing flavors. Um, so, you know, those are things that we really look at when we're trying to decide how do we want to do something and pay homage to the way it has always been done. Um, so I think, you know, the other thing is, is thinking about what you're going to plant in your garden and how you're going to use it later on. Um, you know, I plant more peppers than I ever need. I mean, I plant so many peppers. It's just ridiculous. My husband laughs at me and I say, I'm going to use them all this year. And then I don't use them all at all, but I do have a dehydrator and I do dehydrate them all. And then we grind them and we make, um, you know, a pepper flake that we serve on all kinds of things. So um, I wanted to go over some of the menu that we had tonight in a little bit more. Are you guys getting dessert about now? Yeah, all right, good. So uh, just to go over some of the menu, and I'm sorry if you weren't there for it, but you do have recipes um, to make some of the major components of it. And if you have any questions, you're welcome to reach out to me on social media, or I'll give you my email address when we're done here and you can reach out and ask any questions. The first course was barbecued carrots um, with pickled pecans and Henry Bain dressing. So the 
barbecued carrots, we rub down very heavily with this barbecue spice and salt and let them sit and gives them a little bit of cure on them and then we roast them. Uh, the Henry Bain dressing, which is traditionally like major grays, chutney, um, pickled walnuts, which are very hard to find now, um, and lots of, lots of Heinz chili sauce and, and things that just aren't that interesting. Um, we take those and we remake that dressing completely in a new way. So instead of adding pickled walnuts to the dressing, we pull those out and we add pickled pecans on the plate. Um, you know, if you have a beautiful ingredient, whether it's a vegetable or a flower or an herb, you want to showcase it. So we have pickled pecans on the plate separate from the dressing. And then the dressing is has got the recipe. And if you see it, there's a, a lot of ingredients in it. And I actually took a few out <laughs> because I, they're homemade and I didn't think you guys would be able to get them. So there normally are more than that. But, um, you know, that idea was to how do you get barbecue flavor on a vegetable? How do you pair something that's traditionally served with meat, serve that with a vegetable. So that's one way to kind of reinvent and to get those classic Kentucky flavors in there. Um, the next one, you had smoked pork shoulder uh, with filled peas, sweet greens, and bacon fat cornbread. And I'm going to show you guys how to make this bacon fat cornbread in a few minutes. Um, what we do with the smoked shoulder is we use, um, we use this piece of the pig, so we use the, actually it's the butt or the shoulder. Some people call it the butt, some people call it the shoulder. It's the opposite of the ham uh, that they use for the back when they would traditionally cure a country ham. We use a different part, um, but when we first opened Freight House, I really wanted to have some sort of smoked pork dish on the menu, but I didn't have a smoker and we were just starting out and I didn't really want to, um, I didn't want to invest in one. So I thought, how can I get this? How can I achieve this without it? So what we do is we make the smoked brine, um, then the meat brines for at least two days. Uh, did I explain the smoked brine? I can't remember if I did. Mm, no, okay. Um, so what we do with the smoked brine is we make a brine of salt, sugar, nitrate solution. Um, and we just do a little bit of nitrates to help kind of keep that pink color. Um, we make this, we take pecan wood and we catch it on fire. And when it gets really, really smoky, we take all the brine and we dump it on there and we put the fire out. And this brine gets this intensely smoky flavor. Uh, we then strain it out, we smoke or we brine our pork for two days. Uh, if you're not doing as much in your recipe, one day is fine, but we go for two days because we do it in large amounts. Um, yeah, so we start with this flavor, this smoked flavor. When it comes out of the brine, we pat it down with really good smoked paprika and smoked chili powder that we make in-house. And then we braise it overnight uh, with dried chilies, Dr. Pepper, because I feel like Dr. Pepper and pork is super, super Southern. Um, yeah, so it has, you know, it has all kinds of different ingredients in there. Dried prunes, dried cranberries, dried chilies, Dr. Pepper, sherry wine. Um, we put, and we use a really a fortified flavorful stock. That's another key to a good dish. Uh, we serve that with filled peas. We have a farmer in Marion, Kentucky that grows all of our peas for us with sweet greens. You guys had some sweet greens. Um, that is another preservation technique that we found was happening in Eastern Kentucky. Um, they were putting a lot of sugar and a lot of vinegar in their greens as opposed to the way I grew up eating them, which they kind of had a more bitter flavor. These greens have a lot of acid, a lot of sugar, and it helps to preserve them so that they stay for more than you know two or three days they'll stay for three, four, five days because they have tons of vinegar and sugar in them. And then bacon fat cornbread, everybody, you know, I always hear the argument, Weta, Michael and I always argue about whether or not you put sugar in your cornbread. And I say you do, and she say you, does, you don't. And I don't know, I think I'm right, but <laughs> she thinks she is too. So um, I think that it's a very Western Kentucky thing to put sugar in your cornbread. I don't think that people up in central Kentucky put sugar in their cornbread. Um, but we also put a ton of bacon fat in there. You know, and traditionally people eat their cornbread with butter. We wanted to come up with a different way to serve cornbread without butter. So we're doing a fennel aioli, which is just an emulsified oil, um, you know, using egg yolks. So it's still super rich like butter, 
but um, we can flavor it as we wish. And then I don't know if you guys had like raw sliced onion on your table growing up, but every time I would go see my grandparents, they always had raw tomato and raw onion sliced on the table. So we wanted to put a little raw red onion and then just some fresh corn basil for brightness. Um, so that dish is a classic at the Freight House. It's been on the menu since the day we opened and it's one that really encompasses a lot of what's happening in Kentucky cuisine in one plate. Um, and then you guys had your pear bourbon hand pie. I mean, that I think even more than a Kentucky dish, that's a, you know, a very classic French dish, it's a galette. Um, items were made similar to that for coal miners to take into the mines in Eastern Kentucky. And so they were usually closed all the way and stuffed with different fruits. We left those open a little bit for you guys with a little whooped cream and some smoked salt on top. So I hope you guys all enjoyed your food. Um, I'm very jealous that I'm not there eating it with you guys. Uh, I had macaroni and cheese with my daughter for dinner. So I think you guys probably beat me. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to go a little bit over the menu and um, are there any questions I need to jump in that I've missed so far? All right, well, if that's so, I am going to do a demonstration, a little food demo for you guys. Um, and I'm gonna just have to move my camera really quick or my computer. So while you're moving that around, Sarah, I'm wondering, can you talk a little bit more about Freight House? If someone travels to Western Kentucky, how do they check your um, restaurant out? Yeah, so, um, I mean, you, you can find us, you know, at freighthousefood.com, um, we're there, we're open, you know, times with COVID are, have been a little difficult. So we have our limited hours, but we're open Tuesday through Saturday. We're right in the heart of downtown Paducah. There are tons of places to stay. Um, you know, it's interesting whenever um, my, so this kind of talks a little bit about Freight House, but also a little bit about my, my folks. Whenever they had contacted me from Top Chef to ask if I wanted to do uh, to do Top Chef, I told them I didn't know if I could, I couldn't leave. And my mother told me it was my civic duty to do it for Paducah, Kentucky. And so she doesn't remember it that way, but I very, I, I very much remember her telling me that I needed to do that. And I'm so glad that I did because, um, you know, the amount of times they said Paducah on national TV was so great for our community. And what I really wanted to do when creating Freight House was, tr I strive to create a destination spot so that when people are coming to Paducah, they're really doing more than just coming to Freight House. It's such a quick drive from Louisville. It's like, you know, three hours if you drive really fast, four hours for me, you know, so it's, I'm a pretty slow driver. So um, yeah, you can come see us. We have a huge whiskey selection and the menu changes all the time. Really the only thing you're gonna always get, and I wanted to try to give you guys a little taste of that, was is the pork shoulder. And there's one or two other dishes that are always there. But other than that, everything it changes quite often. So, And I will add, because Paducah is in the central time zone, if you travel from Louisville to Paducah, you're gaining an hour. So it's not really a three-hour drive. Yeah, it's not. It's, I mean, until you go back and then you're... <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's just, it's such an easy drive. And I think that, uh, you know, we get a lot of visitors from Louisville. And I think that it's something you can feel good about. You know, I, I love going to Louisville and dining at restaurants there. I feel good about supporting my other chefs and my contemporaries. And I really know where my money is going and who it's going to. And I think that you can feel that same way when you come to Western Kentucky and you dine at Freight House. You know, we have a completely open kitchen and we'll show you around it. We're not scared of anything we're doing there. So um, I'll show you my little kitchen at home, though. I'll show you guys what we got going on right here. All right, so we are going to do, let me grab my recipe. So this is my grandmother and we called her Gimper. Um, I don't know why we called her Gimper, but Eastern Kentucky, uh, you know, the first, I, or I guess anywhere, the first grandchild gets to decide what everyone is called. So the first thing I've got is I get my oven on to 425 um, degrees right now. 
whenever I start making this, I'm gonna turn it down to 350. So we just wanna start, you always want a really good hot skillet. And this is my grandmother's skillet. Um, I don't even know that it's that great of one, but man, it's got good memories. So uh, we have, we got three of those out of her house and there are two at the restaurant and one here. And that is the only thing we ever make cornbread in. So we're gonna start with dry ingredients are gonna go in one container and wet ingredients are gonna go in another container. So we need a cup and a half of cornmeal and I'm just making enough for one pan. Your recipe that you got at home is enough for two pans, but if you just want to do one, you know, just cut it in half. So we use um, Weisenberger Mills corn mill. It's the oldest grain mill in Kentucky, hydropower. They call, you call them, they grind everything for you and send it to you the very next day. So we're gonna go in here and then I've got three fourths a cup of flour. And I'm a fan of white lily flower. I like the softness of it, and I think that it gives things a really great crumble, especially biscuits and cornbread and stuff like that. So after that, you've got two um, teaspoons of baking powder. Um, yeah, two teaspoons of baking powder. And I'm a horrible baker because I really um, don't like to measure. So, you know, and then you've got half a teaspoon of baking soda. And then two teaspoons of sugar. So you're just going to start, just mix those ingredients up so that everything is good and done. Then, okay, you guys. I don't know if you can tell, this is a pint container, so two cups, and that's completely full of bacon fat. I don't need all of this, but the recipe calls for a third of a cup. So you need a third of a cup for in here to go with your wet ingredients, but you also need another third of a cup for the inside of the pan. I and mean, we don't call it bacon fat cornbread for nothing. Um, Sarah, we do have a question that's just come in, and this comes in um, from the, Zoom webinar from Donna, and she says, looking at the recipe sheet, is there a re or what is a replacement for baking grease? Say someone has dietary restriction or is vegetarian or vegan. Can you recommend it? So I will recommend for um, you can you can replace with butter if you want, but I feel like sometimes when you use butter, it gets really um, brown around the edges and then it kind of drops. The thing is, is butter is not pure fat. So butter has a significant amount of water in it. So when you add butter to something, and most of the butters you get at the grocery store are about 72% fat. So that means you've got 27, 28, yeah, 28% milk solids in there. So liquid. So you notice if you ever melt a pound of butter down, you have that liquid at the bottom. So using butter in a recipe that doesn't call for butter, even though it sounds like it would be delicious, it actually is not that great because you're introducing a lot of extra moisture. So I would use vegetable oil, or if you're vegan, I think there are some really beautiful vegan butters out right there now. I really like this butter called Flora that we use for vegan. Um, and you know, vegan butter is essentially fancy margarine. So, you know, there's, there's that, but I would um, I would usually use vegetable oil or um, or just, you know, I don't use butter though, unless you have clarified butter. Clarified butter would be great, but it's really hard to bake and, and substitute butter for things that call for, call for oil. That's a great question. So, all right, so we've got, you guys can hit me up with anything like that. So we've got all of our dry ingredients here. So we'll set that to the side. Then we've got, oh, you know what, I forgot my salt. There we go. All right, so two eggs. And a little trick for cracking an egg, if you crack it on a flat surface, much less likely that you're gonna break it and the shell is gonna go inside. If you crack it on a, the edge, you end up like pushing all of those little shells into there 
and you're mo it's more likely you're going to get cracked shells in there. So always crack your eggs on a flat surface. It'll save you from having to pick a lot of those cells out of there. So the reason that we're doing our um, wet in one bowl and our dry in another is because with cornbread, and that's the same with a lot of quick breads, you really don't want to develop gluten. So you want things to be, um, have a really nice crumb to them, a really soft texture. You're not looking to develop gluten. So we wanna mix everything when we do something like cornbread as little as possible. Or if you make, even if you make a cake, you know, a lot of times it says whip this in, mouth this in. It's not wanting you to develop the gluten, it's just wanting to, to incorporate it. So we're doing all of our wet and then we're adding them to the dry. So we've got our eggs here. We have buttermilk here. And if you don't have buttermilk at home, you can use whole milk and add for about a cup of whole milk, you just need maybe like, um, you know, I don't know, maybe a, a teaspoon and a half of vinegar or you can even just do like the juice of a, of a lemon, half a lemon, and you squeeze that in and let it sit and it'll be fine. My dog is like roaming around over here now because she, she smells the, the bacon grease. She's a happy dog. And Sarah, I'm gonna follow up with um, a question um, for a vegan option if, or you're um, lactose intolerant. Um, rather than using milk, would you recommend say a coconut milk or a cashew milk? What, what are other alternatives that could be used? Um, so there are a couple milks out there right now that I think are really good. There's one called Ripple. I know you can get it at Kroger. I've gotten it at Kroger and Paducah and Kroger and Lexington. Um, it's made with peas. So it's a pea milk. Um, and I believe it's probably made with dried peas. Uh, and it's just really good. It has the perfect amount of sweetness to be very comparable to heavy cream. It has the same texture. It's full of protein. Um, it does have some fat that's been emulsified into it. So if you didn't know that you weren't drinking, you know, heavy cream, I mean, I don't think you would know the difference. And it's called Ripple. I think that's a really good product. Um, I like coconut milk. I've done coconut milk in cornbread before. You want to make sure you use the unsweetened one. And I did a cornbread one time with coconut milk and a bunch of lime zest and a little bit of tamarind in it. And it was absolutely delicious. So coconut milk works too. Coconut milk does have a lot more fat than buttermilk. So that is one thing you have to play around a little bit with. Um, and then, you know, I think that the buttermilk we're mostly looking for is the acid. And I think we can talk really quickly about baking powder and baking soda. So baking powder is um, a leavener that's activated by heat. So you can mix that into things and you're not going to get activation from it uh, until a heat. So there's a chemical reaction. Baking soda gets activated by heat, but also by moisture. So you wouldn't want to mix this up and let it sit around. You want to make it and do it. So, um, you know, you can still add, I mean, you could probably try water, but you're going to need to put a little bit of lemon juice in there because um, baking soda loves acid. That's what really makes it and pop. So really pop up really good. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting to see all of the, the other options right now out there for vegetarian and vegan cooking. Um, yeah, I think this could very easily be done and you could also very easily add herbs or spices to this. Super easy. So I have a very hot pan here. So full of bacon grease and I need about a third of a cup in here with my stuff. So and I, I don't know if you guys can see how much baking grease is still in there but it's it's a good little bit i mean you want that to almost fry up on the bottom and so i'm going to get the camera really close so you guys can check it out so now we're going to mix the baking grease in with the eggs and the buttermilk then we're going to in with the dry ingredients can you guys see good Okay. So in with the dry ingredients, 
I just make a well in the center. I add everything at once. And then I just fold it in. So I'm not trying to develop any gluten. I'm not overly mixing. I'm just coming up in the bottom and folding in. And you can see there's still a few little spots in here that are kind of wet, some that are dry. Once you don't see any huge spots in there anymore, that's it, you're done. Don't keep mixing. I think that's a lot of times people do that with pancakes or with waffles, things like that. So this pan over here is pretty hot. Did I lose you guys? So you can see that it is really kind of bubbling up around the sides. I wanna cook that cornbread until when I shake it, all of the sides separate. So you can see over here, this side isn't really separated, but over here, it's almost frying. So I'm gonna shake it until all the sides separate. And that is the trick to a really crispy bottom and a really moist center. So right now we're essentially frying the bottom part of it in the fat. And this would work if you used vegetable oil and coconut milk, this would work for anything. This is the trick to getting a really crispy bottom that's not burnt. You want it all the way around and a really moist center. So you can see this piece over here is starting to pull away, but it's just not quite yet. I love cornbread so much. <laughs> I just don't know that there is, I mean, I love biscuits too, but man, cornbread is quite delicious. So I'm seeing this all pull away and this is gonna go in the oven. And it goes for about 20 minutes. The 20 minutes is a nice like convection oven as long as you had it turned up really high at 425 and then you turned it down to 350 right when you kind of started to melt all the bacon grease and stuff. Um, you know, at the restaurant where we have the commercial and you know industrial ovens, uh, sometimes it only takes about 15 minutes. Um, but at home, it's usually 20 to 25 minutes and you want to cook it until when you pierce it, it comes out clean. And this is my handy dandy tool. It's a cake tester. I use it for every single thing. This is the, one of my favorite kitchen tools. So that cornbread's cooking. I don't think we'll still be here. Well, we might still be here when it's done, but um, I cooked one off ahead of time. I actually cooked two. My daughter ate some for, it was really cute. She had a whole entire, I gave her a whole entire piece of cornbread and she was like picking it up and eating it. Bye. While we're waiting, Sarah, we do have another question that's come in from yeah, Patrice. Um, she's asking if um, someone has wheat sensitivities, what would you substitute for wheat flour in the cornbread? Well, I think that um, I think that right now uh, there are there are a lot of um, gluten free flours out there that work extremely well. Um, I do have a recipe from an old cookbook that calls for cornmeal and cornstarch. Um, and what it ends up doing is it ends up getting so crispy on the bottom. It's almost like, um, it's delicious. But um, I'd be more than happy to share that if anybody wants to reach out to me and I can get them that gluten-free cornbread recipe. But I think a lot of the gluten-free flours out there are really nice, um, you know, but the one with the cornmeal and the corn flour, is is really good. I said corn starch, but I meant corn flour. I'm sorry. So yeah, but this was the one I cooked earlier. And I'm going to hold it up for you guys. So you can see that on the bottom here, it's perfectly crispy. And you can see where the fat came up the side and cooked up the sides of it. And it smells like smoky, bacony. You know, this this smells like smoke. And that was 
you know, one of the things is how do we get these smoked flavors into very classic dishes? You put a bunch of bacon fat in there. Um, yeah, so there's, there's a way to kind of um, alter anything for any dietary restriction. And I'll throw in there that that's something Freight House prides themselves on is um, being able to accommodate pretty much any dietary restriction. And we write our menus in a way that does that. So um, that's the cornbread that you guys, if you were lucky enough to have, that you got to eat. Um, I am open for any questions, maybe not any, but pretty much any questions. So um, you guys can fire away and ask about whatever you'd like. So while we're waiting for some more questions to pour in, um, definitely thank you, Sarah, for um, your presentation, as well as the demonstration with the cornbread. Um, but one question that did came in again is clarification on the recipes that you shared with the audience. Is yeah. that under the greens, um, someone has asked, what is- Under the what? Ice, and, um, oh, under mean? greens, greens. Um, they've asked about the word case. Um, and I'm wondering, are you creating much larger portions or how would they interpret what case is in the recipe for greens? Oh, I'm sorry, one more time. Under greens, uh -huh. what is the meaning or the, how do they interpret the word case? Is that the amount of green? Um, how do they portion that? Yeah, so, so I'll tell you what, so a lot of these um, recipes we created for the people that were cooking dinner tonight. And um, a lot of them I have that have been downsized. I have those available. The case of greens is a lot. That would be like if you went to the farmer's market and you bought, you know, like the, the square bushel of greens. Um, that, or I guess a half bushel is what we call a case. Um, that's going to give you enough greens to serve probably 20 people, but they freeze really well. So I would think that if you went to the grocery store and you bought about six bunches of greens, um, that you could downside, you could cut this recipe in half, six to eight bunches of like collard greens. You could cut that recipe in half. Sorry about that. You guys, I didn't think about that when I said those. Another question um, I'm wondering, Sarah, hopefully I'm not chopping up again. Um, what did you find was the biggest challenge? Like say we're going back to Top Chef where you were given those quick fire challenges where you had 30 minutes. Um, what's going through your mind when you've got that much pressure or are there times when you want to make something great at home and you, you, know, you don't want to do like a mac and cheese, but you want something really tasty and quick? How do you know, other than through experience and trial and error, to kind of sample or try this or that when it comes to something where you're very short on time and under pressure? Yeah, so I think, um, so there are a few, and I've, I've done some of this before, is there are a few pantry items that I always keep around. And I think that, um, you know, this was something my mother taught me. You know, there's always canned tomatoes, there's always canned beans, there's always pasta, there's always tomato sauce. Um, you know, there's, there are pantry items that really kind of give you the freedom to do stuff. But if I am looking for a very quick meal for my family, it is matzo ball soup. So it is matzo ball soup and it's done very fast. And, um, you know, even if it doesn't have chicken in it, uh, we will poach eggs and put eggs in there to, and to replace the chicken. And that's something I always have matzo mill around. If you don't have it, um, you should try it out. We have, I have some rest, I have some uh, chan, I have some videos up on my YouTube channel that can show you how to do some of that stuff. Um, yeah, I think quick go-tos are, you know, I don't know, the top chef on the um, quick fire challenges, I'll tell you, if you watched the show, a little behind the scenes thing, when they say 30 minutes, I mean, they mean 30 minutes. There's no like 30 minutes and then you're like hanging out, waiting for it to start. Like when they say go, it really happens. Um, so you come up with a million ideas and then when they present the challenge, none of the ideas that you have come up with fit it. So you're just kind of running around frantically and figuring it out. But um, yeah, I've, I've gotten pretty good at doing that now that I have a little girl, I can run around frantically and figure out a meal pretty quickly, so. Oh, 
Uh, right. Okay, thank you. Um, and raise it up so Allison can um, collect that and bring them to me here. Um, another question, Sarah, is in the garden, in your garden, are there any vegetables that you don't grow or you can't seem to have success with growing? Um, celery. I don't know how to do it. Just it's it's like it doesn't grow straight. It's all crooked and wobbly and it never is. It's so bitter. It's just the most bitter thing I've ever tasted. Um, I really have trouble with celery. Um, one thing that I love to grow and um, we keep some seeds around the freight house so that we can share with people if they come in and they're gardeners and they're looking for something interesting. We've saved seeds over the years. Um, they're called Trembocina squash. So they look almost like a butternut squash, but the bulb on them is about the size of an orange, so not as large as a butternut squash. And the neck on them, I think probably the best one I've ever grown, the neck's been about four feet long. So some people call them trombone squash. I've seen them called snake squash, but different than like a snake gourd. Um, and they have this beautiful bright red orange flesh that is significantly sweeter than a butternut squash. And they're just one of my favorite things to do. And they're such a perfect portion for you at home because if you wanna cut you know, enough squash for two people, you cut off this much of the neck and then you cook that much and then you know a couple of days later you cut off a little more of the next so that's one of my favorite things to grow um also just since it's such an heirloom variety um yeah and then you know my husband is a cattle farmer he's an attorney but also a cattle farmer and we've really been playing a lot with growing cover crops that we can use in the restaurant later on so daikon radishes turnips um you know growing some rye and, and getting some rye seed from it and trying to process that for the restaurant. So I've really enjoyed seeing um, what we can do with cover crops in a restaurant. Okay. Um, a couple more questions coming online. People in person, how about some comments about what you enjoyed most about the meal this evening? Is there any insight um, that you've after tasting some of Sarah's dishes? Um, and one question coming in from Beth is that have you ever found a dish outside of Kentucky that reminds Oh, goodness. Um, a dish outside of Kentucky that reminded me of home. You know, I think that when I was in, uh, when I lived in New York City, and that's the farthest I had ever lived away from home on my own, I found myself going to a lot of soul food restaurants and a lot of like fried chicken joints and stuff like that. And I think it was just because I felt like I was a Kentucky girl eating fried chicken in a place where I wasn't supposed to be. Um, you know, but I think anytime I get something with pecans in it, it makes me feel like home. Anytime I get something with bourbon. Um, and a lot of times I think apple butter is just any type of that pureed apple. Anytime I eat applesauce or apple butter, it reminds me of Eastern Kentucky. So, yeah. So what's interesting is we asked our um, audience here um, who had the dinner, the meal, and um, we asked what the favorite was and resounding people have said dessert. Uh, but it made me think we are at home. Has anyone tried Sarah's rum runner recipe by chance? Mm -hmm. And maybe, you know, maybe you're not following me very well because you've had too much of the rum runner, <laughs> uh, but that's an update on the hot toddy. So that's a question. That's a question for anyone at, um, in the virtual world, if you want to respond to that. And the next question comes from Patrice. And she says, for those who haven't seen um, the Top Chef competition, season 16, um, she asks, what did you create there? And can we find the episodes on YouTube? Yeah, so um, I don't know that you can see them all on YouTube, but I know that you can watch them all on Hulu. And I know you can watch them all on Peacock, which is like the NBC streaming service. Um, so a lot of what they did on Top Chef season 16 were uh, challenges that had to do with Kentucky kind of culture, um, you know, the history of Kentucky people that were famous, you know, we were able to cook at the Muhammad Ali Center, we cooked at Rep Arena, you know, we went to Keeneland, uh, Churchill Downs. So a lot of challenges taking place all over the state of Kentucky that had uh, significant, the people who we were um, 
you know, paying tribute to, they had a significant impact on that. Um, I did a lot of, um, let's see, I made some cocktails. I cooked a lot of pork, a lot of pork. Um, I actually served the pickled walnuts that you guys had tonight. I served those on Top Chef and I came up with those on a whim. And Tom Colicchio said, he said, I needed to put more pickled walnuts on, or pickled pecans on my dish. So um, yeah, we did a lot of different stuff, but that show is an amazing show to watch if you're a foodie or if you're into learning about where your food comes from. It's not a very dramatic, there's not a, a lot of that off drama. It's mostly just about cooking and it's all professional chefs. So it's a, it's a fun show to binge if you're at home, you know, during COVID. <laughs> And it's it's a fun one to watch as well because um, if you're familiar with Kentucky, um, all the places where the quick fire challenges and the other challenges were, or um, like you mentioned, um, Weta Michael was out at the Avish. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of like you'll see you'll see the Avish at times, and then you'll see other landmarks across the um, the state. So that makes it exciting. Well, um, it gives you a little behind the scenes too, because if you've never actually been in the house at the Avish, that's where we lived. So we lived in that big, huge mansion and it was an amazing space. And um, the, the gardens there at the Avish, um, you see them go from being nothing but tilled ground to being full blown gardens. And like you said, some were beautiful and some were just weeds. They were not, I don't even know how they, found any vegetables for the challenge, but they did. And just out of curiosity, um, the AC was not working in the mansion when you were there taping, correct? No, and <laughs> no. And there were people, you know, there were people from San Francisco, um, Minnesota, New York, Philly, I mean, all over the place. And they came, they brought winter jackets. I mean, they, I don't think they had any clue what they were getting into coming. We filmed in Kentucky, um, all throughout May and June and it was hot I mean it was like the it was like the middle of May to the beginning of July and it was hot I mean if you're from around here you know what it's like you know they brought they brought down jackets that <laughs> the AC didn't work and we it, there were some there were a couple pretty miserable nights but um, we got used to it so um, a couple more questions is Jan asks um, can we get the recipe for the dessert? And I don't think it's on the recipe sheet. Of course, yeah. And then Jan also then follows up to say, do you think you will ever publish a cookbook? So that is an interesting question. Um, I am currently working on a cookbook. Um, it is not, you know, it is, I'm learning that it takes uh, significantly more than what I thought to write a cookbook. But uh, yeah, we're doing a cookbook and we'll be including lots of different recipes and they are all kind of based around um, the Kentucky seasons and how things grow in the season. That's how the cookbook is organized by the seasons. Um, you know, we have that. If you do want more cooking videos, I will be starting, if you pay attention to our social media channels in the next um, week or so, we will start advertising. We have lots of cooking classes coming up. So stuff that focuses on Thanksgiving, on Hanukkah, on New Year's, so all kinds of stuff. So but yeah, there's a cookbook in the works. Great. Again, all right, so we're at 810 right now. I have no other questions um, filtering in. So again, I wanted to, again, thank you, Sarah. I definitely appreciated you taking time out of your schedule across time zones during the um, interesting period of 2020 um, and an open invitation to you. So if you wanna come back to Louisville, let us know. We'd love to show you the Avish, what we've all done there. We actually grew celery the, um, the first year after you guys left and it looked beautiful. It was straight and whatever, but um, because we had kids coming out, we did not harvest it. Um, so they could see what the plant looked like. But when we did taste it, it um, was very stringy and it wasn't as sweet as we can get in the grocery store. Um, but we'd also love to um, host you here in Louisville so you can see what we've done here at the Botanical Garden site because there's an interesting history there. So again, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, also, thank you to Sherry and her talented staff with Farm to Fork Catering and Cafe. They brought Sarah's um, recipes to life for um, our attendees here at the Grazer Family Education Center. Um, and I also want to thank um, Elizabeth, Allison, Dan, and John this evening, who are fellow staff member um, from the Botanical Gardens to get this um, 
virtual and in-person annual meeting off the ground. Um, so again, thank you everyone, um, attendees. Again, we, are re we have recorded this presentation and those of you um, who have signed up will likely be getting an email um, with the link so you can watch this again or share it with other people. Um, the website for Freight House, again, is freighthousefood.com. And Sarah, any last words when it comes to reaching out to you? Do you want it done on social media or? Yeah, so if you go to our webpage, um, there is a, a contact us and you can go on there and contact. It'll send an email directly to me and that's the easiest way to get through to me. Send me any questions you have. We'll make sure everybody gets that dessert recipe. And if you have any other like questions about anything, reach out, even if it's just a random cooking question. Love to hear from you guys, love to help out and come and see us when everything gets better. Great, thank you very much, Sarah. Hope you have a great rest of the fall and uh, a prosperous and healthy 2021. Thanks you guys, bye y'all.